Good evening, lenticular artists, or perhaps morning where you are. Michael Brown and Mark Diamond here. We're going to do an interview, first in what I hope will be a continuing series of interviewing people that are either lenticular artists or involved in the lenticular field in some manner, partly for historical documentation and partly just so we can all share what we're doing. So with that, I guess I'd like to uh, introduce Mark Diamond. Mark is a holographer and lenticular artist from Miami. And I've come up with a few questions that I would like to ask you, Mark. I, and I guess, first of all, maybe you could just start and give us a little overview of your career. I know you started as a professional photographer at a very young age, which is a pretty interesting story in itself. Uh, I started as a photographer at a young age and then as a professional photographer at a young age as well. Um, I was living in the Republic of Panama, and uh, my parents, I was born there, my parents lived there, uh, they're both gringos from Brooklyn, but they met during World War II down there and got married and stayed there because I guess it was paradise and uh, compared to Brooklyn at the time. And so um, it, I was born there, uh, I started taking pictures around this age here. Uh, Started taking pictures around this age, which I guess was like five and a half or so, something like that. And uh, then um, professionally, when I was about 15, I started working for uh, as a photojournalist for like local papers and some of the independent papers, of which we had many more back in the day. And uh, and then one day I got a call for, uh, because my pictures were being syndicated throughout these, uh, the, I want to call them like hippie stoner kind of papers back in the like left-leaning mm, rags that were uh, abounded in the late 60s, early 70s, which is when I was there, or so early 70s when I got involved. Uh, and uh, yeah, so they had a sort of an associated press kind of thing for underground newspapers for all the places around America where there was a lot of young kids like Ann Arbor and Berkeley and New York, Miami. And unbeknownst to me, the pictures that I was taking here were being sent across the country and used in the Berkeley Barb. And, uh, and um, Annie Leibovitz, who was a photo editor for Rolling Stone, saw them at the time and uh, called me, not knowing I was a 16-year-old high school dropout. And she said, uh, can you please help me shoot uh, the Republican and the Democratic uh, conventions? Uh, and I can't get there. Uh, can you do this for me? And I was like, yes, ma'am, absolutely. And again, I had no idea. I was just a 16-year-old dropout. And uh, and I said, what do I do next? And she says, well, I need you to go to the, the Poodle Bar at the Fountain Blue Hotel and meet Dr. Hunter S. Thompson and take it from there. How did that take you to the field of holography? How did I switch to holography? Yes, yes. Um, after being a photojournalist for a while, um, a couple of years, I read a little article by a woman by the name of Peggy Sealbon, who is the New York um, Times photography writer, and she had done a little blurb about the New York School of Holography. And I had seen holograms when I was like 12. At this point, I was like 17. And uh, when I was 12, in the, uh, by coincidence, the Coconut Grove Art Festival, which you participated uh, uh, from most famously, um, the, they had a traveling show of laser viewed holograms. And I saw them there with my dad in, 19, in uh, uh, well, I was 12, so uh, it was like 1968. And, uh, uh, but nobody could explain it. And even if they could explain it, they probably wouldn't explain it to the 12 year old. So I, and so that was just like a flitting experience, which I'll never forget, uh, seeing uh, uh, like a half a dozen glass plates in a dark room uh, with red laser light on it. And behind this sort of window is a dictionary with a magnifying glass in front of it. And it makes it a dictionary with a magnifying glass in front of it. And as you move from left to right, you can selectively actually utilize the magnifying glass in the image to wow. lend the book that lies beyond it. And yeah, they're, this, they're amazing, the, the holograms. So now, obviously, you're known as a master in holography, but lenticular, when did you transition into the, the field of lenticular? Yeah, I have kind of a meteoritic uh, compulsive absorption of, uh, well, basically, I claim to may have made more mistakes than anybody in this business. 
<laughs> That's <laughs> arguable. They say that at least there are people that <laughs> step up to the plate and argue with me. But, but I believe I may have made them in a shorter period of time. Uh, so uh, I started nine years ago this month, making lenticular officially. I had made them, shot them before where other people like the famous um, on the East Coast, uh, Grayson Marshall, uh, who is very well known for doing a lot of Hollywood, like theater, 3D, 3D theater, marquee lenticulars and things like that. Very, very fine work. Um, I had seen him and collaborated with him in the, in the sense that he gave me instructions on how to shoot lenticulars way back when I was making holograms. So I snuck in a couple of large lenticulars back when I was making holograms. But now it's the exact opposite. It, it, it's all lenticulars all the time. <laughs> I like hearing that. So, do you remember the first lenticular you made? Well, the first one I shot, I, I shot before, I mean, for, you know, in the process of learning, um, was actually done before I had printed it, and, I mean, could print it. And uh, it was an aerial from about 35,000 feet um, of a mountain range with clouds and whatnot, uh, you know, while, while in a commercial aircraft. Wow. So I have another question for you. You work out of Miami, and Miami is like a hotbed of high-end art. They have Art Basel, they have Art Week in Miami in December, and there are multiple shows around the city, international galleries coming in. Uh, what, do you, what have you learned about Lenticular in, in walking those shows or talking to artists that come in for those shows? What have I learned? Yeah, like... <laughs> Have you walked the show, seen anything interesting there? Have you had some of the artists that come into Miami for Art Week come and talk to you? Yes, I think I think the general uh, scuttlebutt is, uh, or at least in the large two shows, which up until this year uh, were a primary you know, a focus of, um, of the so far art business. Um, I think the consensus is that more and more lenticulars are appearing. And this last show, very specifically, I didn't get to go to the dogs here working. And you sent me some pictures out of the were posted some that were fantastic. And Art, uh, I went to I, Art Winwood. Got it. Got it. Well, um, at the big tents that I've seen, uh, there's more and more stuff. Uh, uh, it's like any medium. You're going to find a certain level of uh, finesse, and then you see other things. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, of course, the famous um, Jeffrey Robb has uh, uh, done, you know, amazingly well and beautiful work. Uh, uh, almost always appears with these things in one gallery or another. Um, some stuff out of Korea uh, that I can remember. I have a habit of taking stereograms of 3D of lenticular. I started with holograms, and I do it right into this domain now. So. If you show me a nice particular, I have to take a stereogram of it close to the record. Strangely enough, sometimes I notice things. I will notice things in the stereogram of the I didn't notice for whatever seconds I was looking at the real thing that was being held in front of me. So I recommend it as a trick to um, study what you're looking at when you're not under pressure to move on to the next thing. I think that's true in photography in general that we can take a picture and sort of savor it, especially in portraiture, when you're right in front of the person, in some ways you're in their space, but when you have that finished result, you can really you know, scan it and see details that you might not have seen otherwise. And certainly that's happened to all of us shooting a commercial job where you're in the moment and you're capturing the imagery. And then all of a sudden, when you look at the pictures, like, oh, well, why didn't I move that thing out of the background or something? I mean, photography lets you really reflect on the the visual image. So, got another question for you. Would you any like to show us any of your work? This is why probably so many artists use photography as a tool in the process of what they're doing, even if photography is not the end result intended of what they're doing. And uh, to me, photography has become a tool. Um, I don't see it as an end all anymore. And I'll tell you a funny story that everyone, I guess, on this sort of very might circuit just watching um, so in the old days I would take one photograph as a photographer 
been around 1977, a couple of years, uh, a couple of years, a few years into holography, I realized that I could be taking stereograms of holograms as a means of documentation. And so I started making stereograms in the late 70s to document my friends and colleagues and, and my own work in 3D, either at an international show or in my lab or whatever. It was a, a quick way to get a 3D picture of a 3D picture, so to speak. And, um, and so, although technically holograms are not 3D pictures, it's a whole other animal. Anyway, <laughs> so I started out taking one picture as a photojournalist in the photographer. I, I, then I, I started taking two pictures to take stereograms. Then when I started working with lenticulars, I started taking, you know, 30 or 100 pictures. And now, for the last two years, I've gone back to just taking one picture, if I feel like it, because I am doing depth mapping uh, of, uh, of my legacy images, or anyone's images, into one particular form. And I guess I better use a, 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 a show and tell to get a sense of what I'm talking about. So here on the wall, maybe a little bit of an unsavory camera move. Uh, I'll keep it horizontal, folks, uh, and switch the lenses so we get a better sense of uh, what the heck I'm talking about. Uh, it's still calling me. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess it's not that responsive. And now you're I gone. I turned the camera on and off, not switching the camera. Some somewhere there's a way to switch cameras, right? Hmm. There is. There should be a little looking camera. Yep. You would go to your camera microphone setting, go to camera and switch from front to back. Purple. No, if I go. If that doesn't work, Mark, why don't you switch to your screen and just show us the uh, desktop? The camera. Yeah, what an odd uh, thing that I can't just point the camera forward. Uh, I, Beautiful portrait of you. First time I've seen that is not. Yes, it's an odd that it is not an option. Uh, the cam button simply turns on and off the cam. Huh, weird. All right, this is a design flaw. Uh, let's see if we can work around it. Um, I will, uh, I've never used this software before. Um, I'll go ahead and bring you up to speed as to what you're seeing on the screen. If you want to switch from your side, the, can you do that? Uh, yep, let me put that on there. Let's see Wait here. Go ahead and switch over to the monitor we'll see. Right. I was, there you go. Uh, awesome. Right here you're looking, the sad part is I, I don't know how I would show you um, the stuff that I want to. And this is why we practice our live streaming. All right, so we have some temporary difficulties. Mark's working on his camera and his desktop right now. So while we're waiting for him, maybe I'll, oh, and he's back. It's not option in stream. In this there you go. Now show us your, your uh, computer desktop and uh, software. I'll carry out the screen. Yeah, let's go through this on the screen instead. Um, sorry about that, folks. So, uh, so what we're looking at now is, uh, is a Photoshop of something that doesn't exist. Uh, it's a 24 by 8 cactus. I've been very big on uh, doing studies with uh, live uh, uh, plants. And uh, uh, if I can back out of here for a second, uh, I can show you something more specific. Here's the actual original image, which I was going to show you sitting next to me. Oh, look, here's my dog standing on it. This is uh, like a three book foot by four. Wowza. So that's a giant lenticular. As Mark disappears. <laughs> Well, I don't know what uh, high-speed internet connection he has. I know right here I have a pretty fast upload, so I can continue. He is back. Okay, and this is up. 
Yeah. Very. There you go. Okay. Yeah. You're full screen. Okay, and, and you can hear me, all right? Correct. Okay, great. Back to where we're going. So here are the dogs standing on a, a three foot by four foot swatch of that same material you just saw in the other thing. Um, I do sometimes composites to try to convey what the images are going to look like in a given scenario. So here, for instance, is a bedroom with one of my pieces that's also round. Um, this doesn't exist in real life yet, but it sure looks good. <laughs> looks awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, another example here, the, the, so sadly, the late Zaha Hadid, the super amazing architect. Uh, this is her kitchen here in her apartment in, in Miami. I think the, the apartment is going up for like $12 million. And so one of my pieces there on the left, which doesn't exist in real life. But it's a nice way to pre-visualize how something might work in an environment. Um, here's Absolutely. Here's um, uh, uh, my botanical pieces, the fern and the mon monstera on the right. So I've done real life things <laughs> besides Photoshop composite. Um, so I, there's a lot of obviously condominium type action in this uh, uh, city. This is um, a pretty challenging piece. It's uh, six feet by four feet backlit, and it uh, it actually consists of um, over a hundred images is uh, 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 combined. Uh, the building was done in a in a CAD environment, and the buildings behind the building I shot from a helicopter in a uh, match a matching uh, perspective uh, in real life. And uh, then uh, the clouds are a, a archive image I have of from sunset. So this all went into this. Oops, wait wrong scene and too big. Here is the installation view of that piece. It's wow. In sale from a, the, the condo, which is seen in a model form on the right with the gigantic touchscreen thingy on the left. So there's a little example of the real thing that uh, is not composited. Um, I shoot, uh, uh, sometimes people bring me um, their, their, their pets. Uh, so if I can get this thing to hmm, interesting. Will it go bigger? Oh, they're gifts. Oh, that's odd. Uh, uh, well, let's see if I run. No. Oh, he's just trying to open in Photoshop. That's not the intention. I'll take you through a random selection of things. And here we go. Uh, unfortunately, Photoshop is coming up on this screen. It's just not necessary. Uh, okay, great. I think I'm back. Uh, this is a hologram. It's only four by five inches to the little toy guy to indicate the uh, you know, scale of what's intended. Um, uh, you know what? I'm going to surprise myself and just flow through these. See, uh, there's a piece that is a three-foot diameter in particular, a lagave in a wood uh, four-inch uh, wide uh, frame. How do you cut that circle? Uh, this was done up in East Hampton by Danny Meeks, who's a master... Uh, frame maker. Um, I don't know if that's required, but it's just I'm just super grateful to have to, to get to work with people like him. Um, wow. Anything frame between New York and Long Island, uh, just so good. Uh, here's a collaboration with an artist. She creates these scenarios. Uh, Bonnie Brook and Smith inside um, inside the little uh, cigar boxes. I guess Joseph Albers maybe did uh, that. Cornell made Cornell. Anyway, I've made it getting an artist on, I guess it's going out. Uh, again, a black and white version. Um, I work with a lot of different artists. This one actually is an animated piece where it's spraying, and it's 3D. Uh, shot handheld. I shot a lot of, I shoot a lot of stuff handheld. This is an airport installation of an animated uh, thing. Oh, we were going to try this experiment. Um, this is a stereogram, which we can Olympic of. Um, I'll leave that up for a second. You guys try to make it bigger. No, sorry, sorry. Try it at that scale. Uh, maybe some people in the audience who do this readily uh, would actually see what's going on. Well, I can view that both uh, parallel or across you. Okay, so that worked. I've turned that into um, several different formats. Two-dimensional, uh, like a display on proper uh, you know, museum paper. 
I also did it as a light box via uh, uh, Charles Wheatstone uh, light box with Nerf. And I also did it as one ticket. So it's really interesting to be able to repurpose in several different media. Oops. Uh, this is Austin Tuna, the project uh, I did with uh, Clayton Muncie from New York. Um, I, uh, I've been filming Native Americans the, uh, in uh, intertribal powwows for over 20 years. Um, I can show you a few of them. I don't want to drag on with it, but I can show you a few of them here. And I hope I could. So were you doing full 360 holograms when you did this? Exactly. And after decades of filming 360 degree holograms with individual it's on a turntable, like you see here, mm -hmm. originally acquired with 35 millimeter Mitchell, sometimes I reflect mainly Mitchells because of the registration ability of the double pin registration, double claw, extreme, like they use it commonly in Hollywood for about seven years and animation because of its extreme uh, uh, registration ability. And um, so I film since no sound is required. So it can be a really loud, giant camera. And uh, they're on a turntable slowly rotating and I'm directing them. And these were originally intended for holograms, but I do use them to make funiculars and they look quite, quite nice. Um, they look quite nice. Well, I bet. Well, that one's interesting because her arms are moving up and down, that would make a pretty interesting kinetic lenticular. That would be a pure lenticular experience, the same thing, uh, but maybe different terms. But we used to call it, uh, I just realized we're, we're talking to an audience that's a lot more savvy than the average audience. So let me get a little more specific. But um, yeah, we have this thing we used to call time smearing in holographic stereograms. And that is when the subject is moving too fast and there aren't enough frames. And so you end up with odd stare stepping effects and things that just look nasty. That's actually a great so term. I, I've, what you're seeing with slow motion. Yeah, I've experienced that kind of smearing effect on lenticulars, but I never thought of calling it time smearing. Yeah, this guy's porcupine hair dress, uh, headdress just goes on. This whole story is amazing. All those beads on his staff, and I said, you know, what's up with the beads? You know, what does all, what does all this mean? And he says, it's the story of my life. And, uh, and he went into how the different colors reflect, you know, different tri uh, tribulations he was going through and stuff. But um, uh, so this is one series out of about 30 or 40 things that I do in series. I'm, I'm feeling a little more challenged now that I cannot simply grab my phone and walk up to 101 things that lie behind me where I'm sitting. <laughs> uh, we have to figure out there's got to be a way to to just have the forward pointing camera. Uh, well, I have the phone pointing at you. I suppose you could just walk, pick it up and turn it around. Or not. You appear locked up. I'm gonna go back to your desktop, which seems to be working just fine. All right, Marcus. You're back, but you're frozen. Oh, the joys. All right, we yeah, have Mark back. Hey, Amen. At least we had interesting, pretty picture while um, I was fussing with that. Um, this one, so this one's here's, nice. Uh, here's uh, Bart Bates' Batter Boy. I try to not take any of this too seriously, um, mainly for health reasons. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, here's a commercial project for, I guess he's number one, uh, the number one uh, Spanish rapper. 
His name is Bad Bunny. He was on the cover of Rolling Stone a couple months ago. I not that familiar with his music, but uh, produced these pieces. They went on to affixing. These were actually used as uh, awards, and they glued or bolted somehow the uh, you know platinum and gold records on the bottom, left and right. And it was interesting. Um, and here's another simulation of one of my real pieces, but in a real bathroom that does not have the real bees. Um, it's an accelerated way to get people to understand what you're talking about. Here, uh, a suspension of these uh, kinetic uh, fluttering birds in a lobby, and these like cartoon cloud shaped pieces. This is what the birds look like now in uh, an array of nine. Uh, um, so, Here's something that I do commonly, and I'm wondering if I can't come up with a clever way to show you uh, some of this stuff. But this is uh, uh, 1953 Miami Beach, Beach, and I started with a black and white image, which we then hand colored, and then after hand coloring it, it was then depth map, and then after depth mapping it, it was rendered as 36 frames and made into a lenticular, which is four, uh, three by four feet or so. Let, let me see if I can um, find a clever way to show you, um, I, I might be able to create a way to have a browser replaced. Yeah, of course I can. So if I went into my blog, this is very interesting, uh, and I went for the, uh, just type in the word beach, I guess, see what happens. Ah, there it is. So here you can see an animated GIF of that very photograph which is a little more exciting than what I just showed you a minute ago. Now you can actually see the sequential frames. Yeah, it's looking good. And so that was a, that was a convenient way for me to demo something. Uh, in the end, what happened was... Uh, let's see what happens now. Uh, okay, I got rid of that, didn't I? Um, okay, I was doing so good. Uh, back to that for a second. Um... Uh, I was going to go ahead and show you the actual installation view, um, which goes like this, um, like this. So beyond the, I did four pieces. This is the actual black and white I started with. Um, here's the actual installation view of the lobby, the historic lobby where you see the lenticulars are mounted up there. And oddly enough, they were taken in the very room that you're looking at the mats in. So it's a very strange feeling. That's a gutsy place to hang them on the stairs because I would be walking and looking at them and hopefully not missing a step. Myself. I found that rather odd myself and certainly something to alarm the uh, risk management people. Um, so here's a, a mosaic of the wider view of that room. And uh, here's an interesting one. We did, I tested, but we didn't print, which is just lovely. Um, my friend uh, uh, in uh, California is a uh, master uh, scanner. Or if you ever need the best scanning of a painting in the world, he's the guy, artscans.com, David Coons. And he actually de uh, screened this for me, which is interesting. This was just a cheesy 19, early 1960s postcard with all the awful uh, rosettes that are known to printing when you blow up a print job. Oh, wow. All the dots and whatnot. Yeah. And they were all taken out with some German plug or Russian software that he has as a plug into Photoshop, which uh, specifically de screens printed matter when reproducing, you know, situations that you don't have access to for the original. Um, so, uh, which I didn't initially. Initially, all I was given was some 72 DPI stuff, and it, it took me a while to actually dig, uh, search out the negatives. Once I searched how, out, like, how big did you blow up that postcard? The postcard became uh, almost four feet. That's amazing, especially knowing there's that screening pattern you had to get rid of. No, that went, once that one was taken away from the scan, then I was home free from the rest of it. Here's a white right that we did not colorize, but this is on the wall behind me in real life, but I can't show you because it's an odd camera. But uh, 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 this was directly from a like two by three inch negative that I, after three months of research, I actually found the negatives from the wow. 1950s, which was so, well, the client gave me these 72 DPI things to work with. And I said, you want me to make these in 3D four feet wide? Are you kidding? 
And so after research I did on my own, that was another that's a duty to 3D. Yeah, we won't talk about that now. But oh yeah, I have to do a, a pitch for my blog. Uh, uh, my blog is it's all a hologram blog. Um, and um, uh, it's a rather eclectic, here's a person who's in 3D, right? Obviously. Um, uh, so it's kind of eclectic. So if you really want to be specific, just type in something like, uh, this would be funny, 3D. Um, you'll see a bunch of entries. That, that was unfair. That was unfair. Um, yeah. Uh, more granular would be like uh, uh, advanced or just optics or cameras or anything like that. And you'll see uh, some things that I find interesting. You know, here, what are we looking at? Um, uh, not necessarily my work. I, it's not all my work at all. I think 80% of it is other people's uh, cool, interesting things. Like, hey, Mark, I, I, I guys... saw you were on that Rick Globus section. Talk, when you after this, talk about that when you're done with this one. Yeah, this is uh, well. Since we have technically oriented people here, we might as well get to the point. So we can talk about the past, we can talk about the future, or we can talk about the present. Um, just uh, for the future, um, it, because billions of dollars have been invested in the last few years in um, machine vision and um, uh, pattern recognition. Uh, namely, uh, the auto, uh, autonomous vehicle industry is driving uh, machine vision and computer uh, pattern recognition research. If anyone's interested, there's a group that meets every year. It's an IEEE uh, special interest group called Computer um, Computer uh, Machine Vision um, Pattern Recognition. See, however that abbreviates, and you can look that up pretty easy. And um, but, but some, by some good fortune, the way I see it, um, we're, uh, as 3D image makers, we have the benefit of, um, of uh, kind of uh, milking the, what falls from that research into our domain. Like, what I do now with these two to 3D things, um, I'm predicting, and I have a team, you know, it's not myself. Um, there's uh, Graza in uh, Georgia and a couple other people on two other continents that I work with. So I put together like a little virtual studio, and what I was going to say is, um, uh, while much of the handwork and, and is being done now by expert individuals, um, I predict in three to five years a totally automated um, methodology. The reason I bring you up to this page on the log that's related to this is because there are these guys that work for Mapillary. If you're not familiar with them, they're the people who Mapillary.com. They're the ones who have been trying to outdo Google Street View by having consumers upload their own personal images to make a faster. They're up to over half a billion images now. Um, uh, and so uh, there's a team, a research team over there at Mapillary that happened to have presented this meeting I just described, uh, which I would not add, but I, I read the paper. And uh, effectively, uh, the, the trick being how to understand. Uh, uh, from a thing to understand what is implied in three dimensions volumetrically with simply a two dimensional photograph s submitted. And the simplest way I could describe this is, for instance, um, let's say you look around the room you're in and many, 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 many objects, let's say uh, in this scenario in front of you, uh, actually live somewhere on someone's computer as a CAD data set. All of the mechanical specifications of that object that is either whether it's your phone or a spatula or you know, uh, <laughs> woman, man, camera, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but seriously, uh, objects that are fabricated that live with uh, their data sets can inform uh, uh, some kind of machine vision. So if you simply took a picture of me here now, um, there's at least a half a dozen or so objects that a machine would recognize as being a particular product or something that correlates some known database uh, describing its dimensions. From that point forward, a lot of things can be determined in terms of the, uh, compensating for focal lengths and whatever. The point is that uh, we're getting, we're going far fast. And uh, my goal is to automate myself out of a job. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be exciting The because this also you know, brings the related field of the whole depth mapping in your phone and the LIDAR sensors that are, you know, now going into phones. And so, as you indicate, a lot of 3D is going to be automated, which will make it easier for us to make 
lenticulars because we'll have the image, we'll have the depth, and then we can do our magic. I, Mark, can you go to that Rick Globus post you had? That was fantastic. I saw that a few oh. months ago, and I thought yeah. those circles were amazing. Whoa, 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 I forgot how it came up just now, what the search was for. Uh, but it couldn't have been too many years ago. Uh, I mean, a month ago. Here we go. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm, yeah. This is, oh, I, I know. Just type in the word globus. Yeah, sometimes I That's forget. what I was thinking. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you must be referring to... Yeah, one of these two. Yeah, that one of those circle. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, those are really cool. So, are those just color change, or do they move? What's going on there? Uh, I. It's an interesting uh, issue because I brought. I executed it two different ways. Um, this is um, a depth map from uh, layers that I initially was presented. This was done. Uh, a beginning of a memorial project for the artist group Lovis by the Lovis Family Foundation. And uh, I started out using, uh, uh, three-dimensionalizing it, and then I tried it as a type of flip where uh, the various layers are, re are partly revealing and partly overlapping. And it's interesting. It's, it's definitely very, very interesting. Um, there's Rick. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm not sure what those sounds are, uh, but he was a very, very amazing artist and human being, and um, it's been an honor to get to play with uh, these elements and, and readdress them, really. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm just so kind of high phone being the picture of me, and so maybe I just turn the phone upside down and point it forward or something. Yeah, and just use my, use my computer monitor to see what the phone is well, All right. Well, I'll switch to your phone. If we'll try it out, I don't know if we're going to get uh, vertigo or not okay. doing this. All right, let's try it out. There you go. Green while moving around. Okay. So here, for instance, is a three-foot diameter. This may be world's first fisheye uh, lenticular, and hopefully, someone in this crowd will correct me if I need to be corrected. But um, it's a photograph I took in uh, the year 2000 in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica at. Uh, the outpost, Out Island Outpost Resort, uh, Strawberry Hill, spa, and Hotel and Spa. But my point of it is that nowadays I'm revisiting uh, some of these uh, old photographs that I've taken, and uh, some of them are more or less appropriate for uh, three dimensionalizing. Um, here's an actual hologram. Uh, this is a pulse hologram. Uh, pretty well known hologram, actually. Uh, actually, what's first smelling hologram that doesn't stink? Um, hey, Mark, and, uh, can I can I pause you for a second? There's a question yeah. that came in, and the the question was, the circles was that a collaboration with someone? You mentioned the Globus Brothers, but uh, what was done with those oh, yeah, photos? So that was part of Rick Globus. I simply was given the two dimensional layers as he had taken personally. Uh, sadly, the day before he died and uh, wow. to go work on it. And uh, yeah, it was kind of just, just heart-wrenching. But, uh, but we've re uh, I've been, re oh look, here's a version on, the, on my desk. This was an experimentation with, uh, for the most part, clear material. It's used, if you can go down to an office depot or order from Staples, um, it's typically used in the old fashioned uh, uh, overhead projector uh, uh, business. And, sure. Uh, so you can run it. You can run it through an inkjet, but it's for the most part transparent. I don't know if this is obvious from this cheesy video, but no, it is. I can but, see your uh, hand behind it. It's it shows as a transparency. Right. Okay. Good. 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 I did the same experiment with some of my birds. So just it's constantly a map for me. Um, I reserve a percentage of my day or night or early morning hours, or whatever to just experimenting with no particular thing in mind. It's kind of like jazz, uh, kind of hard to explain. Um, this piece I did as a prototype initially. It's been in a few installations. This was uh, a prototype for a Bank of Tokyo, and uh, it's going to be 600 square feet in the lobby. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we, have a, we have a special guest, apparently. 
Hey, man, I want to say hi to you. You going to hang for a minute? Yeah. Hey, can I use the internet? Anything you need. Uh, uh, here, it's on my business card. Everybody, it's Luther Campbell. Come on, right. give it up, give it up. Mark it up. Woo-hoo. It's Mark. All right, here you go. <laughs> it's my phone number. All right. Is number? Yeah. What, what name? Uh, so we're getting oh, completely out of control, but that's part of the fun, the oh, authenticity. That, that was um, Luther Campbell from, from Two Live Crew. I feel like I'm on a TV show now. I've, I've got, like, special guests of bearing for two seconds. But that Reality was, TV. He has a TV studio, I mean, a, radio, a recording studio next door, which brings me to my next subject. Um, I, wait a minute. Wait, uh, before, you, before you go, another yeah. question came in. Okay. The fish eye, did it use a circular Fresnel-style lenticular lens? Did something like that ever exist? Oh, my God. This person's after my heart. Uh, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> something I want to know. Um, when I first got into this particular business, uh, you know, I, I was staring at some melts I had around here, which I used a lot in holography uh, for various experiments and different things. And, uh, and I love uh, Augustine Fennell. He was, he was cool. Uh, but it, 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 it dawned on me that on a, you know, on a, a micro edge surface, maybe not micro edge, but on a surface relief of, of these, these lenses, they bear an extreme similarity. And I have a deep intuition that some amalgam of uh, uh, lenticular and and Fresnels can somehow come together to allow these darn things to project lenticular images anywhere we want, give or take, you know, a couple of few feet in space crisply by augmenting some layer, whether it's a holographic optical element or whether it's a Fresnel lens. But something tells me that downstream, obviously people in this form know that you know, there's a lot of research being done in nanotechnology and nanofabrication techniques and the ability, even in metamaterials, to have optical materials that behave differently under different conditions. So so we're really on the cusp of, like, like stupidly incredible uh, 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 array of potential uh, material science development. Um, but you know, lenticular is hard enough. Uh, uh, lenticular is hard enough without worrying into a uh, Fresnel. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is a normally oriented 20 LPI micro lens lens, probably one of the last pieces they had. In fact, I know for a fact, one of the last pieces they had. Um, here uh, is um, uh, a, uh, let me see if I look back on the screen, some frames, right? This is an actual record pressing plant life size. So the electroplated mother that you see in the middle, that as they call it, that is a 12 inch, or at least the inside piece is 12 inch, which kind of has a clip on it. But this is actually uh, a record plan. Now, again, I don't know how this is looking because I don't have a monitor at this second, but you should be able to even maybe if I move around. Wow, this is tough without seeing what I'm doing. Plus, you've got a crazy latency. Maybe it's a low frame rate or something. Um, so I'm not sure if I can do that down. Um, uh, let's try here. I'll keep trying. So this is uh, a little more complicated. All right. Um, this is a photograph I took in 1974 of B.B. King because I used to do that. I worked for Rolling Stone and I ended up shooting like 300 musical acts. So I've been revisiting some of them in 3D. Um, this one is, as I said, BB King, let me pull out since I'm in the horizontal mode. And so uh, this was a little bit trickier because I started out with my own photo, with my original photograph. Then Zaza built a, da- a depth map. Then I produced uh, algorithmic drawings of each frame. So now we have this odd combination of lenticular photography, uh, algorithmic drawing. I can't seem to see a smooth move on the screen, but maybe you get a sense that it's 3D. It's kind of an awful camera situation. Well, I, I like the close-up view because you could see the algorithmic drawing oh, aspect okay. of it, which is cool. Okay. okay. It's just that I'm looking at my computer screen. I guess there's a, like a quarter second lag or half a second. Right. Nonetheless, right. oh, here's an interesting thing, and I'm sure everyone in this forum has come across this. Uh, here's uh, an incredibly uh, fantastic screw up where I run the film through back. So this is totally pseudoscopic, but nobody seems to know this. And uh, are we still transmitting? Yeah, you know, sometimes the pseudoscopic stuff ends up really playing with the interpretation of the viewer and they see more motion in it. At least that's what I found. Like the reverse perspective faces. I think you stopped transmitting uh, the camera tra- picture as your main picture. Well, looky there. Okay. We're, ba- so, we're uh, back. 
So yeah, so here's a case where this is crazy depth. This scene is about 40 feet deep. The fact that you can even see the walls 30 feet behind them is, is just bizarre. Wow. Yeah, especially since it's pseudoscopic. It makes it even weirder. But uh, this was the first time ever, just trying to give people on this thing something worthwhile to experiment with. Um, uh, uh, this is the first time ever I made a lenticular from something shot with a 105 millimeter lens. Huh. So it was a very curious thing that happened. It was almost like we've condensed, you know, how telephotos uh, slam it down. Yeah, it reduces yeah. the parallax. And then a lenticular kind of like opened it up again. You know, like it was re-popped uh, out. It was very strange. All right, let's go back to what's floating around here. Um, so, was, was that another 20 LPI mark? That yeah, super deep one? Gotcha. And uh, these are some of my TV sets. Uh, not my brownies. I mean, they're all mine, but uh, some were done for my own, mostly for my own images. Like, we're drawing with, uh, based on what I'm seeing on my TV screen, completely toast. Uh, I have no way to control this camera. But he's talking about the seven things you can't stand TV. Um, I thought there was some kind of automatic gain or something on this, so that you could see what's really happening. Uh, oh, that's looking good for exposure. All right, let me pull out, just uh, go for a wide view. <clears throat> so here's a classic example of how one can take, this is the freedom, basically, of being able to work with um, the depth mapping two dimensional images. Um, I was able to composite this entirely from scratch, well, more or less from scratch, uh, except for the picture of him. And uh, like the eyeball is from an eyeball manufacturer's company, and I just thought that was like a really good one. And uh, and so, yeah, first composite, then depth map, and now you can go back to doing whatever you were doing. Uh, here's uh, Pete burning his fingers on a roach. Um, it's an old photograph I took backstage uh, at the performance of Pete and Tom. Uh, and uh, now, of course, depth map. Um, here's a larger piece. This is uh, the sacred uh, uh, geometry of plants. And so it's like a nine, nine, nine shot thing. Uh, whoa. Very strange walking around this camera because it's going uh, to feel like I'm drunk or something. Every move I make is a half a second later to it on the scene. So, hey, show that Holmes viewer that's on the right. You had showed the pictures before, the uh, three stereo photos. Oh, yeah, scary man. Yeah. So here's something that, uh, well, doesn't exist in the real world. That's called uh, vectoring the donuts. And uh, uh, here's, um, uh, these are, I got this in East Hampton. These are, Actually, it's called um, Jackson Pollock's Bucket List. They are his actual bucket. Wow. Um, let's see here. Let's move on. So, um, it, oh yeah, here's here's the uh, here's one of the later ones I've done with um, uh, recently. Once I started working with the televisions, I don't make I don't I go ahead and I make scary ground. I mean, you know, like. 100 exposures of each TV. And so I actually can use it to produce like flat TVs, so to speak. And uh, yeah, that's, that's so cool. And, uh, the other trick that I've done for years, and I don't know what anybody do, I use antiquarian frames from the 1800s and I clone them with, you know, somewhere in the 36 frame range captured. And then I just use that as an element within what I'm doing. Uh, here's another one of the computer graphic related ones. Uh, uh, which has a nice, sort of nice action in, in that film there. If I can, boy, I wish I had a real camera to do this with. Um, uh, so uh, this is like the most complicated thing. Let me bring it off the wall. Most complicated thing I've done so far, just about one of the most complicated, with over 144 images. And uh, this was actually four feet tall and a vertical, not a square. I just kept a little square proof. But you can see there's like other iterations of their bodies in space that are at different levels of transparency, as, as well as uh, the weird uh, sort of zone pattern, interference pattern thing going on. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on there. Uh, this just finished uh, this weekend for um, a prototype that uh, I'm hoping we're gonna reproduce the vehicle as life-size 
cars in lenticular form. This is Mr. Uh, Walter Bentley in his 1920, fir his first three liter. And uh, so there's a giant hotel going up called the Bentley here that hopefully I'll be doing various Bentleys in the lobby. Uh, these were, were simply my first prototype test uh, which was uh, just for this weekend from classic, uh, classic images. Um, here's for the lenticular people, since that's all we got here. Um, here's a little uh, trick I can share. I'm trying to just think of what tricks I can share. So I learned after years of doing these fake 3D frames to do um, fake mats. So um, uh, very often, uh, one of the curses of using 8x10, 11x14, 4x5, 16x20, and these silly sizes, which are not arbitrary, but are really holdovers from the photographic history, um, so we end up with aspect ratios that mean nothing in relation to the available material. So in this case, well, that's not as much trim, but say you have a 16 by 20, here's a good example, a 16 by 20 photograph and uh, a lenticular going to make or image, but it doesn't obviously, if it was taken with a 35 millimeter, it doesn't conform to the format. So here's a portrait I did of, uh, of, um, strangely visited my studio, Gallagher, the guy who used to like smash pumpkins. I mean, smash uh, watermelon. And uh, so the comedian, actually a, a chemical engineer, strangely enough. Uh, wow. But, uh, uh, yeah, you never would have thought about it, right? It was <laughs> um, but what, the reason I brought this up was because here's a photograph that has nothing to do with 16 by 20, but I conformed it using this little mat trick. So basically, once you've got your uh, you've got your interlaced, uh, you very simply select uh, the edges and uh, stro uh, stroke it. Uh, uh, you know, anywhere from depending on scale, you know, eighty-eight or so pixels, and then make the next one thicker or thinner to, to, to your liking. So that's kind of an interesting thing: is creating these fake mats. So with the fake mats, is there any depth to that, or are you just stroking the outer image? Uh, for some image? weird reason, depending on how thick you make it, uh, and I was just talking to somebody today about trying to tackle the bezeling, I mean the beveling part, because I've been going through these like radius looks, mm -hmm. just what I do, but it doesn't have to be. Um, uh, yeah, it could it, 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 uh, restate your question? Oh, the depth. Um, yeah. Brain, to believe it. You know, there used to be a visualization software for frame shops, and that would allow people to take a picture, put a beveled mat around it, put whatever frame profile. I don't know if you can, you know, find that still, but I remember that. Great idea. In my case, what happens is the picture is so startlingly, startlingly 3D that, that the brain just sees that, that relief edge and just, want, you know, can believe that it's an eighth of an inch, step, you know, like... Right. It's a strange thing. You just want to buy this stuff. Ah, here's something that's unusual for um, particular people. Uh, so here's uh, one of the three top mixed down engineers in America. He's just like dozens of like Grammys and stuff. People send him as their raw, you know, recordings. He makes hit records. And so, uh, but the client wanted to reveal uh, all of these teeny tiny CDs that represent, you know, his, his hit records and stuff. But we didn't want to obscure him or the recording thing. So, so basically, it's floating on, on yet another layer. It's a two-dimensional array of itsy bitsy C C D covers. But you're, it's at a level of transparency that reveals allows to reveal the rest of the recording studio and the portrait as a normal one. Um, this is part of a edition I did for uh, Ron English and Greg Scheinbaum Fine Art Gallery. And so it's actually uh, the Ron English and the um, painter, and this is his creation. I went to film in his studio in Beacon, New York. I've worked with a lot of these uh, famous uh, street artists because it's the neighborhood I'm in. Um, sure. That's Ferry, who obviously most famously did the Obama poster. And uh, But in this case, I've flown. His, he also did the Obey uh, Giant, Andre the Giant. And so the 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 uh, uh, Andre just just happens to fit perfectly floating in front of his face. I don't know if huh. I move if, if you'll get some depth out of it if you see parallax, but this is awful. I'm I'm flying blind here, 
Oh. Well, usually you can pick up parallax, but it's really hard to visualize the, the 3D on a 2D monitor. There's Bo Diddley, who most famously came up with the Bo Diddley beat. Um, here's an interesting concept uh, using um, using uh, uh, one layer of lenticular and, and physically separating it from a whole other layer that has a similar thematic thingy. Um, here's a, this is a prototype uh, maquette for, um, let me see if I can even see my screen from here. Wow. I don't think I can turn that. But okay, how about now? Uh, yeah, this is awful. Um, <laughs> just awful. Well, Mark, we're coming up to, we're coming up to 55 minutes. Maybe you can give us a okay. little concluding okay. remark and then we'll, we'll uh, okay. end this show. Okay. Okay, so I, I put your website on the screen, diamondimages3d.com, so I'm sure people can connect with you there. Yeah. And we lost him. Mark. <laughs> well, we, we lost Mark Diamond. I don't know why. Probably something to do with the, the phone. I hope you enjoyed this. So this is the first time I've done this, interviewing another artist, and I want to do more of these. If you have ideas for someone who might want to be interviewed, or if you are a lenticular artist or in the lenticular field and you'd like to be interviewed, let me know in the comments because I'm hoping to do more of these. And I already have my, my next person lined up. So I want to thank you very much. I'm sure Mark wants to thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Take care.